some of you will know Anna very well, uh, some of you not so well. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, um, her professional background. She initially trained as a teacher at St Mary's, worked in secondary and special education here in London and, and in South Yorkshire. Then she moved into the theatre as a professional actor and director, uh, specialising in community and educational theatre. She spent six years at the Banner Theatre Company in Birmingham and took part in the 30 theatre productions as well as film and TV appearances. Now much of this work was breaking new ground and took her towards a more academic route. She took a degree in drama at Manchester University and then went on to do a PhD there and that, in turn, was followed by a postgraduate diploma in drama therapy at York John's. And as a theatre practitioner, she trained in two physical theatre forms, bio biomechanics with Gilani Bogdanov and uh, 16th century comedian Del Arco. Anna has established an extraordinarily energetic and prolific and an outstandingly successful career, combining her roles as an academic, a clinical drama therapist, and a theatre practitioner. Indefatigable is one word that I've seen used to describe her, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's accurate. As an academic, Anna has held positions at Huddersfield, Manchester, and Birmingham before she joined us here at uh, Roehampton in 2012. And during that time, she's established a truly international reputation for her work as a researcher, as a teacher, and a practitioner. And so I was delighted when we were able to make her uh, appoint her as Professor of Drama Therapy uh, in 2016. That was the first such chair to be established in this country, uh, which was a coup for Roehampton, and uh, a mark, I think, a fitting mark of our standing as a leading centre for drama therapy in the UK and in Europe. That Anna should be the UK's first Professor of Drama Therapy is also very fitting for someone whose work is characterised by innovation and openness to international collaboration, but also for someone who's played such a significant role in developing and establishing what is still an emerging field of clinical practice and academic research. Her generous and expert contribution to developing the field has been felt at the local level here at the university, at the national level through her engagement with the professional bodies for drama therapy and internationally through her extensive work in supporting the creation of drama therapy programmes and initiatives in numerous countries across Europe and in North America. And as the founding editor of Drama Therapy, the peer-reviewed journal of the British Association of Drama Therapists, and she's the senior series editor of Routledge's uh, distinguished series of drama therapy books. She is in huge demand as a keynote speaker at international conferences and as a clinical and academic advisor, including a role as editor of the guidance on standards for the professional accreditation programmes for drama therapists here in the UK. And if that's not enough, on top of all that, Anna is, of course, a dedicated and inspiring teacher, a principal fellow of the ATA and committed to the success and the well-being of her students. We are fortunate indeed to have her as a colleague. So please welcome Professor Anna Seymour.
He used to be able to make six, seven calls a day in Boston. And now he takes his suitcases out of the car and puts them back and takes them out again. And he's exhausted. He drives 700 miles. And when he gets there, no one knows him anymore. No one welcomes him. And what goes through a man's mind driving 700 miles home without having earned a cent? What goes through a man's mind? He travelled 700 miles home without having earned a cent. Carrying, travelling, walking, clearing, cleaning, and acting. Welcome to Anna Seymour's inaugural professorial lecture. We began with an evocation of the drama of everyday life in Arthur Miller's classic tragedy of 20th century theatre, the death of a salesman. And then we segued into an evocation of the work a drama therapist does, travelling here and there to meet clients often in tough and hostile conditions, carrying the metaphorical baggage of their own history and the literal baggage containing the materials that might support clients to understand their history 
and to rehearse what could be ways of creating a new story. Clearing and cleaning a space in which the work can take place. Preparing to act, to attune to roles that they may be called upon to play within the drama therapeutic encounter. The central protagonist of Death of a Salesman, for those who don't know the play, Willie Lowman, the low man, who trudges across New England, riding on a shoe shine and a smile, trying to sell his wares, seduced by dreams of success, but tragically disappointed, who eventually takes his own life. His wife, Linda, pleads, attention must be paid. Willie Loman isn't a great man, but he's a human being. He can't be allowed to fall into his grave like an old dog. And Willie says, you can't eat the orange and throw the peel away. A man is not a piece of fruit. But here's the tragedy, you can't. As we see town centres boarded up and communities decimated by unemployment, we see how the fundamental human capacity to work is frequently denied. The helplessness that this can induce is destructive. <coughs> Themes of blame, shame, responsibility emerge. So it could be Willie Loman carrying his bag who enters into our therapy room. What I will argue through my paper is that we cannot understand the nature of individual subjective experience without reference to collective experience and vice versa. This concept I will refer to as a dialectic. We are ourselves, but we're also part of larger meta-narratives, whether we like it or not. So this is the context in which we work. Fraught, we might say, with contradiction, However, if we regard this from a healthily creative position, we might regard this tension as inherently productive as it engages the dynamics of change. And this is what drama is about, the action that produces change. The play begins, and by the end, things are different, both on the stage and for the audience, because the experience has been shared, albeit individually experienced. So... Thank you to my dear colleagues, students, and my dear husband, George, for walking with me to arrive at this moment. But it isn't just about this moment, is it? To arrive here as a professor, there have been many people who have been a part of my history. Um, I hesitate to use the word journey. It's become such a cliche. Let's look at your Strictly journey, your Bake Off journey, your Love Island journey. <laughs> and of course, everybody knows a bit of psychology, don't they? I mean, what about when you go to the hairdressers? I'm a bit of a psychologist myself. But it has been a journey that continues. And this room is packed Full. Well, it's packed full. It's packed full of talented, clever, creative people. And you've been my companions, my teachers and students. And I want to thank you all. But that will come later in a rather substantial part of my paper. But now I want to say something about how this is all going to work. First of all, there will be no audience participation. <laughs> I faithfully promised my boss, Dr. Diane Bray, who gave me very clear instructions, do not make me do anything. <laughs> and so die. I'm not going to invite you or anybody else to join me here on the stage or I'm not going to come into the audience and sit on your lap or say, can you just hold that piece of string for me? <laughs> what I am going to do 
is to briefly explore some themes that have been central to all my work as a theatre maker, drama therapist, educator and researcher. I'm committed to discovering the usefulness of theatre, its aesthetics, construction, embodiment and its imaginative and narrative possibilities. And this work has been underpinned theoretically by adopting a conceptualization of class society, informed by narratives of difference which recognize social privilege and economic power. It's rooted in a philosophical and political idea, dialectical materialism. Materialism is a viewpoint that explains power relations in society as observable and measurable. Dialectics is the philosophical discourse of contradiction, which regards each entity as dependent on its opposite in an ever-evolving cycle of change. In other words, we understand what it means to feel sad because we know what it feels like to be happy, or that the absence of a thing or a person can be experienced because we know what it's like to be engaged with their presence. We can see this dialectical relationship as embodied and enacted through human relationships, where the balances of power rely on embracing particular roles which contribute to the maintenance of our hierarchical society. For example, for there to be rulers, there must be those who accept and legitimise their rules. If those who are ruled cease to accept those rules, the rulers lose their power. Of course, this materialist conception can start to seem simplistic and problematic when we get into the realms of perception. Something may be present, but we may not be able to see it, and so on. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. We can apply this thinking to feelings in a similar vein. We may feel all kinds of things, but these feelings may not alter our material universe. Feeling powerful doesn't mean that we are powerful although it might help us. So this brings us to the relationship between ideas and actions, the relationship between theoretical ideas and how they are materially substantiated. Circumstances shift and change while we are more or less in control of the factors influencing our lives. This sense of control applies both to the political and the personal, and the dialectic between making history and the given circumstances mean that each one of us, individually and collectively, have the capacity to envisage through our active imagination that things might be different. These are the glimpses of possibility which are explored in the creative world of drama therapy. In drama therapy, we're able to construct whole words, whole worlds. We do things, we work, with material things to explore what needs to be looked at. In the duration of the therapeutic session, the client is metaphorically held by the therapist. But I'm aware that there are many people in this audience who may not, who may not be familiar with drama therapy and what it is. So before we go further, let me explain a little bit about the rationale for our practice. We're all familiar, I think, with how the theatre can provide us with analogies for everyday life. We choose the costume that we want to wear each day in order to project a certain image. We're like actors playing roles, adopting parts. Sometimes we feel that we're at the centre of the stage and we're playing a big part and we're enjoying it. I'm the leading actor. Other times we feel uncomfortable and we wish that we could just get off the stage pretty damn quickly. Sometimes we don't even want to be on the stage at all. Sometimes we don't want to be in the play and we don't want to play a part in our own lives. Sometimes we lurk in the wings, enviously watching another playing the part that we might wish that we could play, and so on. Depending on our point of view, we might consider that our life script is determined 
through inherited circumstance, but more optimistically, we might consider how we could write another script. For the drama therapist, these analogies can proliferate, but there's an added and more profound dimension to our thinking, which embraces the understanding that drama, the dramatic process, is part of human development. It's how we learn about ourselves and the world. We're in a relationship from conception, when the mother begins a dramatic improvisation, talking to her unborn child in utero. Through the sensory earliest phases of development, gradually we learn about feelings through the behaviours of adults around us, which shift and change and are experienced through the body. As we develop thinking and movement skills, we begin to explore a material world where our relationship with objects, space and atmospheres allow us to test out our strength and our vulnerabilities. Eventually, we start to employ imagination to change things into other things, to pretend to be other people, to step into shoes that are too big for us. And, 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 and I've lost my place, and engage with others in dramatic play. And when we play, it's here that the beginnings of morality are explored, within the parameters that are defined by our carers. So here's where we learn about role expectation. For instance, look at my lovely dress. Do you like it? Maria. Thank you! <laughs> How great. Sorry, I told you there wasn't going to be any audience participation, didn't I? Will you ever trust me again? So, here I am in my lovely dress. I'm a princess. But is this encouraged or is it ignored? Is there anyone there to be a kindly audience? to my leading lady, my role in my, development, my developmental drama, or am I alone? Do I even have any toys? Or, I simply, or am I simply stuck in front of the telly with a bag of crisps? Was I held comfortably and warmly in my earliest days, or was I left to cry, or shaken, or shouted at? Was I encouraged to speak and to walk and to play and explore. There's a slight digression I'd like to make here. When I was, learn when I was small and I was learning to walk, my dad was really very, very protective. So every time I got up and started to make my first steps, potentially a big crisis was happening in our household. My dad would go, oh! Oh, like, this is it. Our Anna's going to walk. <laughs> this may account for something. So, as I got up to take my first steps, my dad would be piling cushions around me, which somewhat impeded my progress, as you can imagine. <laughs> it also may account for, later on, why I found gymnastics exceedingly challenging. <laughs> Although, of course, this is only one thing, because that was also accompanied by the sadism of the PE teachers. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'm attempting to do a bit of instant research here to say how many people had sadistic PE teachers, but don't worry, I won't ask you to do that, because we're not doing any audience participation, are we? Anyway, those early influences, how important they are. They are part of learning our, our place, our sense of self within our universe. So, these aspects of play form the basis of the drama of everyday life. Conceived in drama therapy, they can be related to the formal aesthetics of the play in the theatre, where the actor needs to think and to feel, to be able to negotiate space, to tell a story and conjure the imagination. But what do you actually do? Now, I just speak to the drama therapists in the room here. I think every single drama therapist in this room will have been asked that question. And sometimes we give pretty inadequate answers. 
It's not because we're inadequate people at all. It's not because we haven't mastered the power of conceptualizing our practice. It's because it is so difficult sometimes to capture what it means to be in the room and work together, to be present, to be part of that human process of change. Because the knowingness of drama therapy comes through the doing. And of course, the origins of the word drama are about doing. But I will have an attempt, and you can, well, I don't know whether I want to encourage you to tell me later on that my description was inadequate, but let's see. Um, simply put, we work with everyday dramas that clients bring to us, not directly, but through metaphor. We imagine what these experiences might be like in theatrical form, playing with the elements of drama, such as telling stories, organizing a dramatic space, using objects, stepping in and out of characters by adopting their voices or ways of being. This can create what we call distance from the actual experience and therefore enable us to look at what's going on from a more detached perspective. It means that things we might feel that are overwhelming for us can be safely worked with. The drama therapist endeavors to be a respectful, constant presence, not an absent parent. They metaphorically hold the client and offer choices, the freedom to be expressive, and a place to be listened to, which may be denied elsewhere. But the many complex ways in which we do this must be saved for another time. I travel internationally giving papers, masterclasses and training workshops. And here at Roehampton, I teach postgraduates and doctoral students about therapeutic process through theatre, both within the drama therapy programme and on other programmes in the Department of Psychology. In my work, I'm interested in the wonderment of ordinariness, that what we do here and now matters, and that we, that we value what we materially produce as an expression of our selfhood. So this has drawn me to those playwrights and theatre theorists, such as Anton Chekhov and Bertolt Brecht, who seek to honour the significance of the everyday bits and pieces, the routines, the happenstances that enable us to live, to keep us safe or to inspire us. But I've equally worked with the extraordinary writing of the poet Lem Sisse, and I am transfixed, and of course this could be pure indulgence, by the gender-fluid performative explorations of Eloise Letissier in her roles in, as Christine and the Queens, and now simply transformed to Chris. But returning to Chekhov for a moment. From personal experience, I can relate a Chekhovian moment. When now, this involves my husband, and I have checked with him that it's okay to tell this small story, so please don't be concerned for him. <laughs> so, I experienced this Chekhovian moment whilst eating a fat sandwich, and one of our adopted daughters announced that her sister was pregnant. At this precise moment, I looked across at my husband to see mayonnaise had dropped on his beard. <laughs> George, you've got mayonnaise all over your face, I said. Something was being shared, something important, and I said something trivial. But this is what happens in life. The ordinary material circumstances contain our profound experiences. My hyperbole regarding the mayonnaise may have been an expression of my response to the news, but who knows? And so to my favorite, Brecht, whose plays and poems I return to over and over, and who has been my constant companion, my constant metaphorical companion. 
Brecht was a giant of the 20th century theatre, and he was the proponent par excellence of the usefulness of theatre. His description of meeting his audience as spectator echoes metaphorically how the drama therapist pitches up and provides a space into which the client may enter. And I've asked one of our final year drama therapy students, Inam, to read this poem for us. <coughs> Recently, I found my spectator in a dusty street. He held a power drill in his fist. For a brief moment, he looked up, and I quickly pitched up my theatre between the houses. He looked up, expecting me. In the bar, I found him again. He stood at the counter, sweat stained. He was drinking, in his hand a sandwich. Quickly, I pitched my theatre. He looked up, amazed. Today, luck was with me again. In front of a railway depot, I saw him, jostled by rifle butts, amid drumbeats, being hustled into war. Right there, in the middle of the crowd, I pitched my theatre. Over his shoulder, he looked back toward me and nodded. Thank you, Inam. Thank you. And now, we're going to hear an adaptation of that poem written from the perspective of a drama therapist. And th this is written by one of our students at the Northern Trust for Drama Therapy way back in 2006. And she was called, she still is called, Katie Hickson. And my colleague Heather Williams is going to read Katie's poem for us. Recently I found my spectators in a empty space. We had change on our minds. For a lifetime they looked up and I quickly pitched up my theatre before I could flee to the wings. They looked up expectantly. In the night I found them again. They stood at the edge of the world, sweat stained, they were laughing. On their faces were masks. Together we pitched our theatre. We looked up amazed. Today humanity was with me again. In the streets of a wounded city, I found them jostled by life amid the pain and confusion, being hustled into institutions. Right there, in the middle of it all, I pitched my theatre. We stepped into the chaos, and dignity emerged. They looked back toward me. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Inam. Now, there's something that you may be wondering about, which is the, the mask I put on earlier. I'm going to put it down now here because I know I'm not going to sit down again. It could be rather uncomfortable. This mask is a Zani mask. It's a servant mask made by Antonio Fava, who's one of the two maestros of the Commedia dell'arte who I trained with in Italy. The Commedia is a 16th century form of popular physical theatre which has influenced successive practitioners from Shakespeare through to the Italian Nobel laureate Dario Fo. And I wanted to include this figure, Zanni, whose name is derived from the ubiquitous worker Giovanni, the migrant worker from the north of Italy, who might equally be identified as John. You're right, John. Or Ali. Or Mohammed. And I wanted to include it because it's the primary role that was allocated to me by Fava, and it connects with the figure of Willie Loman. Willie arrives at the beginning of the play, carrying his bags which have become a burden. Just as Zanni suffers from curvature of the spine from carrying heavy loads across his shoulders. Willie dies, and in the hierarchical world of the Commedia, the Zanni's role is fixed. 
Then adopting the optimistic attitude I described earlier of a dialectical materialist point of view, the servant figure does not always have to remain so. And this connects me with my own working class origins. My parents, sadly, did not live to know that their daughter became a professor. But I'm delighted to say that my four siblings are here today and our parents would be so proud of us. Those two people whose own education was so limited by their material circumstances, our mother having to leave rural Ireland at the age of 16 to work in a hotel, our dad similarly leaving school as a teenager in order to, to support his siblings. Well, mum and dad, look what your children achieved. Everybody achieved a first degree and postgraduate qualifications. And by the end of this month, Helen, there will be two doctorates in our family. And now the eldest child is a professor. And this is a testament to their sheer hard work, their humility and commitment to make things better for both their family and for everyone that they came into contact with. And so I am moved to dedicate this lecture to their memory with deep gratitude. Which leads me now to the abundance of thanks, which will necessarily seem perfunctory because of the time, but it's stated with sincerity. Firstly, my dear colleagues on the drama therapy team here at Roehampton, especially Pete Holloway, who sadly can't be here today because of his health, and Henry Seabong, who encouraged me to come to Roehampton in the first place. My colleagues, you've been generous and supportive, and I'm so proud to be a part of the team and proud of the work that we do together. Next, Dr. Diane Bray. Di, it was your idea that I should become a professor, and I will be forever grateful for your faith in me. Thank you to the university for having the vision to award me a personal chair in drama therapy. And now to my colleagues in the psychology department. There are very few doors in our department that I feel that I couldn't knock on and ask for help if I needed it. And I know that I would be met with kindness. Professor Anne McLarnan, now the Master of Hatfield College at the University of Durham, and Professor Julie Hall, now the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Southampton Solent University, mentored my application for my chair and encouraged me to believe that I could be successful. And now to the students. And I'm grateful to see so many students, both present students and, post -gra and graduates. <sighs> Crikey, you taught me so much. And I'm privileged to be a part of your training and to know that you'll go forward and you'll do the work that I can't do, that I'm not able to do. But my hope is that you will take me with you in some way so that I can continue to be a part of your work. Much thanks are due to the eminent drama therapists who extraordinarily became my colleagues, my teachers and friends, and some of them are here tonight. It seems invidious to name names, but I guess I'm going to. <laughs> First of all, Madeleine Anderson Warren. Thank you, Madeleine. Marina Jenkins, who is here. Phil Jones, Ditty Doctor, Alida Gersey, who's out of the country, Brenda Meldrum, and Sue Jennings, who's on a plane somewhere. Sue Jennings is always on a plane somewhere. <laughs> Or she's moving house. Sue was one of the founders of drama therapy in the UK and emailed me just this morning. International colleagues both in Europe, the United States and Canada, too many to mention. I want to express my thanks for those international links. 
except that tonight I have the honour to welcome my dear friend and colleague, Professor Maria Hodemaska from New York University, who will be giving the response. Thank you, Maria. And now, in case they thought they weren't going to get a mention, my siblings, my family, Michael, Mary, Matthew, and Helen, you are marvellous human beings. Thank you for being here with me to share this occasion. My nephew, Leo, thank you for representing the other seven nieces and nephews who are not here. However, they're doing great work in the world. So you've got a big job. Where is he? Leo, there he is. Leo, you've got a big job there as the representative of the team. And finally, to my dearest son, who is here with his new wife, Susie. Christopher Seymour, Macmillan clinical nurse educator. How great is that? And my husband, Dr. George Taylor, who was my first teacher of theatre, and who with me adopted our daughters, Cara and Shanna. These two men have stood by my side, and there are no words to express what that means, except this. So I'll end with the importance of theatre to my life, and it's why I became a drama therapist, and why I am proud to be the first professor of drama therapy in the UK. And I'm going to quote my friend and very missed colleague, drama therapist, Professor Dr. Roger Granger. Human vulnerability, our own or other people's, draws us closer to one another, just as fear keeps us apart. Theatre is about the way we see ourselves, the way we value ourselves, protect ourselves, bestow ourselves. Because of these things, it is also about how we discover ourselves, not merely theoretically, but existentially, in and through relatedness. Anna, thank you very much for a really enjoyable, interesting and engaging lecture. I think you can tell from the response we just had that we enjoyed it uh, very much indeed. Um, I hesitate to say this, but I, I feel like you've taken on a journey. <laughs> <laughs> resonated with points of reference from we had Arthur Miller and Andrew Chekhov and Karl Marx. And I also felt that it's also deeply rooted to the real world the kind of experience of the life of a therapist and the therapy setting and thought it was really quite unique and, and, and interesting and gave me a lot of things. So Anna, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, those of you who have been to these uh, occasions uh, will know that we do not take questions uh, at this point, but we do ask a distinguished colleague from another university to respond on our behalf. And as has already uh, been said by Anna, we're really pleased tonight to have Professor Maria Hodemarska from New York University. Maria. Thank you. Vice Chancellor of my guests, Anna Seymour my dear friend. I'm honored to give a response to your paper today. I will reflect briefly on Anna's contributions to the profession of drama therapy and frame her clinical work within her innovations and scholarship on theater as therapy. Anna is an artist, a scholar, a clinician practitioner of drama therapy. She is also a revolutionary deeply committed to engaging in cultural dialogue. Her work frames drama therapy as a form of social political action. She approaches therapy not as a process of rumination, but as a partnership in mutual revolution that's response-able, active, and engaged. 
Rex, in his play The Mother, honored the gifts that are Anna's contributions to the field of drama therapy internationally better than I can when he wrote this. The praise of the Vlasova, as recited by the estate cook and her staff. <coughs> Pay respect to Comrade Vlasova, sturdy warrior, keen and cunning. You can trust her. Trust her when there's a fight, cunning to outwit our foes, keenest of our agitators. Her actions are small, but she's tough. We can't do without her. And in the field of drama therapy, we cannot do without Anna. Anna spoke to us today about whole worlds that are performed in the embrace between a caregiver and an infant, that are performed on the stage, and those that are performed in the therapeutic dialogue. These whole worlds are intersubjective, intersectional, and intertextual. They're places of struggle, inherent conflict, and are thick with the deep challenges and possibilities for change. This work also invites us through the metaphor of the Theatrum Mundi today to consider how structuralized oppression is performed within our bodies, how it's performed between us in our gendered, racialized, classed, commodified, politicized, sexualized, capitalized, imperialized, and poeticized identities. Anna's scholarship is grounded in the politics of Marxist philosophy and contributes to the necessary discourse on critical theory in theater and therapy. And one of Anna's major contributions to drama therapy internationally, and the one that I'll focus on today, is dialectical praxis in the therapeutic encounter. Encounter with each other places us automatically into the struggle. Encounter is elemental to being in the world on the most fundamental and metaphysical of levels. It can be interpersonal, intrapsychic, therapeutic, theatrical, political. We understand dialectical materialism, as articulated by Marx, is the struggle of opposites. It does not occur in a static environment, but within a dynamic ebb and flow of human history, psychology, structuralized systems, and longing. Anna's concept of dialectical praxis is the way that we move that theory into drama therapeutic action. Anna has written, within any performance, there's a persistent, ubiquitous meta-narrative of contradiction. Dialectical praxis embraces, as she wrote, the inextricable reflexive relationship between ideation and its material embodied manifestation and craft. The dialectic struggle is not a crude system of binaries, but complex societal meta-narratives that impose themselves within the intimacy of encounter and self-reflection. In dialectical praxis, the process of therapy is a constructive representation that necessarily contains a capacity to be in critical relationship with itself. A truth, a truth is not monolithic. It exists between and among us, not as a commodity or a thing, but as an impulse, a force, a dynamism, a system of differences understood most fully and clearly when we literally and metaphorically put our iPhones down, stop filming the event, and enter into the action. Anna wrote, we enter a liberatory space expressed in action, a consciously constructed space where choices can be made. In her approach, we're excavating experience and constructing it, not deconstructing it. I promised I wouldn't use a certain word, but I'm not going to say <laughs> The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. This Liberated space is a thirdness, or a third space, that both therapist and person receiving support are responsible for shaping. It belongs to both, not to each one separately, 
This understanding is well traveled by both modern psychoanalysis and contemporary Marxist thinking. Anne's work also offers drama therapists an alternative perspective on the concept of therapy as work towards psychological integration or balance, what some drama therapists call aesthetic distance, reminding us that dialectic struggle does not, if ever, result in a stabilization or balance, but instead a constant, roiling, psychological, decentering that must be negotiated and renegotiated and can never be resolved. How does she teach us to deploy dialectical praxis in the embodied subjectivity, intersubjectivity, and reflexivity of therapeutic process? Subjectivity. Clinicians, especially those in training, twist themselves into knots in search of a way to locate their clinical work within a frame of their sense of their goodness, their good enoughness, and with the intention of maintaining an empathic stance in relationship with the people whom they serve. Terrible is the temptation to do good, wrote Brecht in the Caucasian Shock Circle. Anna's pedagogical work cultivates in her students the capacities to hold themselves and their client in that liberatory space with strength, to stand alongside the client ready for anything that might happen, to tolerate the decentering and instability of discovery. She nurtures existential and emotional muscularity in clinicians through developing the capacity to locate and name contradiction and paradox, not avoid it, minimize it, or deny it. Intersubjectively, her praxis qualitatively shifts the therapeutic encounter from a Kleinian confrontation of face-to-face -to, -face to a revolutionary and collaborative side-by-side -side one. We can confront each other and what hurts, wrapped in each other's arms, with love and courage. Anna uses physical theater as one way to illuminate dialectical praxis as intersubjective process through uh, the work of early 20th century Russian theater maker Sevelov Meyerhold. He developed a system of actor training called biomechanics which is in part a form of embodied dialectics in which each theatrical gesture and action is understood in a moment in everyone's life, not just someone's. In Meyerhold's approach, there's also a focus on physicalizing subtext. And here we're not talking about subtext in a psychological sense where past assault means I want a divorce. But <laughs> in the social political sense, past assault means someone's getting arrested. How do we understand the history written on the bodies of each other and embedded in the political subtext we bring into the therapeutic spaces we co-create and inhabit? Anna's use of biomechanics helps therapists in training to explore these questions through direct examination of the polemics, embodied but often unspoken in a therapeutic way. Reflexivity. Anna and I were corresponding some years ago about the scene in Brecht's Caucasian talk circle when everyone is fleeing for their lives and Grusha, the servant girl, finds the baby who's been consciously abandoned by the governor's wife, Anna wrote. The governor's wife abandons her child. Yes, the child is rescued by Grusha, the servant, through a contradictory process of dialectical struggle. Grusha says she tore herself to pieces for what was not hers. Upon finding the infant, she feels revulsion, fear, tries to abandon the child herself before finally embracing him. The attachment with the child is forged through struggle. This is true on both sides of the therapeutic relationship. We locate each other in the therapeutic encounter in part when, like Grusha, we take an action against all odds inciting an opposite response. Attachment is established from the impulse to reject. Intimacy is about distance. Close is God, in all of us, or nowhere. Humor was also very central to Anna's work, and it not only creates subversive laughter, but also assists us in the therapeutic relationship to engage more complexly and more directly with what's calling our shared attention. French choreographer Maurice Béjart wrote, if you can Joke about something very important. You have achieved freedom. 
Anna's interest in Nobel Prize winner Dario Fo, who invited us broadly to consider if humankind can step back enough from our religion or irreligion to get a comic perspective, is focused on his exploration of the jongleur, the Christ Harlequin figure with deep roots in the Italian street theater of the 16th century Commedia dell'arte. Commedia, as Anna said, is a deinstitutionalized theater created by and for the public square with a particular focus on class dynamics. When Anna studied Commedia, she was interestingly assigned two stock characters. She didn't mention this before. Zani, the witty servant of many appetites, the carrier of the luggage or the baggage for the rich man. Pantaleone, which was her other role. The hoarding, overfed, wealthy merchant. In her scholarship, linking the class narratives and subversions of Commedia with the present clinical moment, we see past those superficial collisions between starved and gorged into the multifarious and knotty collisions and illuminations of the comic and tragic frames across history and time as they perform in the therapeutic moment. Anna invites us to engage with the worlds of the people whom we serve and support from a location that is once at, that is at once precise to our being and experience, acknowledging the thick, complex identities and histories present in the room, and that is simultaneously open-hearted and ever subject to change and transformation. This collaborative stance, the struggle, acknowledges the struggle to attach and to be engaged and welcomes it and recognizes how this struggle is fundamental to our humanity and to the work of therapy. Terrible is the temptation to do good. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.